Kelsey Christopher. I'm a registered dietitian. I help women 50 and up to heal their relationships with food so that they can stop the decades long cycle of all or nothing dieting that's led to food obsession and feel good in their bodies, whether that be, you know, losing weight or treating specific diseases or, you know, even disordered eating. So that's me, Wendy, if you would please introduce yourself. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm excited about this. I love talking. Um, so this is uh, right up my alley and I have been a naturopathic doctor for 20 years. I shock myself when I say that. Um, but that being said, sort of since for the last 15 to 18 years, I've been doing mostly menopause and perimenopause and all the things that go along with it. And, you know, the weight question is something that's super prevalent and it's very emotionally challenging. It's physically challenging. And there are so many things that go into that. And so hopefully today we can work on breaking down some of the things that you can do to approach that um, blood tests you can ask for things you can take things you can do and sort of break it down into sort of usable tidbits that you can start, you know, using tomorrow, today. I love that. Yeah, a real focus on practicality is I think what Wendy and I both want, um, rather than just random stuff to know that doesn't actually benefit you. So yeah, um, exactly. and yeah, so let's start with an understanding of uh, fat gain in the postmenopausal body and muscle loss. Uh, I'd love to hear your take on that, Wendy. Why does it happen? How can we prevent it? So, you know, the fat gain sort of, our bodies start changing hormonally, like I'd say in our 30s. And so some people, I think, you know, we, we're talking about postmenopause, but a lot of the changes start occurring in the 30s and the 40s, and then they seem to accelerate after that once you hit menopause. And of course, all of that is going to change according to sort of what you're eating and what medications you're on. And so, you know, as we approach menopause, men, men are different. Like men have testosterone levels that sort of slowly decline over time. And so men don't experience this rapid body change like women do. And historic, like before we hit menopause, our hormones are sort of going like this. Um, and then as we hit menopause, our, our hormones just basically diminish significantly. And so as estrogen and estrogen's the hormone that tends to give us lean muscle mass, you know, it's the thing that if you don't have it, it creates hot flashes, but at, our body has this protective mechanism of when estrogen declines, it wants to store fat around the middle because it's protecting our bones against osteoporosis. And so it's almost like putting more weight in the core. And so even though this is great for our bones to some degree, it's not great for cardiovascular disease. It's not good for our emotional health. It's not good for our physical health. And so how to combat, how to combat that, you know, has many different ways. And, you know, we'll talk about hormone replacement therapy a little bit, um, but really, you know, hormone replacement is one of the best things you can do to sort of slow that process. And obviously it's a very, convoluted topic and some people are like i'll never take hormone replacement some people are like i'm open to it but i'm afraid of it and so i encourage you to you know reach out to cassie or to me because i feel like if you're going to take hormone replacement to help the you know to help your body feel young and feel lean and not have joint pain it's something that you can do safely and effectively and historically in you know 2002 the women's health initiative everyone went running off hormones because we were all going to have strokes and breast cancer and really the meta-analysis that looked at the same data 10 years later was like oops we kind of did some things wrong in that study so um so basically our bodies are protecting us by doing that from some things um but it's not very fun to be in that body yeah, I think that's a really helpful understanding of the biology and recognizing that these changes are happening for a reason. Uh, and yeah, like it, it may it may not be pleasant and yet, you know, having some empathy and self-compassion for ourselves, which is something I talk about a lot and also knowing things you can do. And just to clarify, as a registered dietitian, hormone replacement is not within my scope of practice. So I would refer them right back to you. <laughs> 
Um, but yes, that understanding that, uh, that, you know, you might've heard bad things about it in the past. And that is more of an outdated understanding, uh, is, is important to know. Yeah. And I think an important addition to that is there are some women, you know, even just this morning, I had a patient that said, is this going to make me gain weight by getting on hormone replacement therapy? Cause they equate it to sort of going on the birth control pill in their youth and then gaining weight, which is pretty common. And I would say that no, it's dose dependent. And if you take way too much of a hormone, it can make you bloated and puffy. But, you know, obviously I'm, I'm aiming for just enough to improve bone density and heart health and cognitive function um, and not, you know, overdosing that, which I think a lot of people are like, let's get hormones to the age of when we were 30. And it's like our bodies. Even if you, you know, people will say, what's the proper estrogen progesterone ratio or estrogen testosterone ratio? And, you know, I always have to laugh about that question because it's like, well, it depends on the person. So, yeah. And this might be a question people are wondering. I know I am at this moment. Um, can someone who's been postmenopausal for a number of years, you know, five, 10 years, start hormone replacement therapy and get some help? So there's something called the timing hypothesis. And what that states is basically the longer you're away from that last menstrual cycle, the greater the risks associated with using hormone replacement. Therapy. Okay. So it may not be a good option. No, it doesn't rule it out. So okay. if someone had been on hormones, you know, for many years and then discontinued for a year or two and then wanted to get back on, you know, with every case and every patient, it's a, you know, you look at all the benefits and you look at all the risks and you look at the blood work and you look at, you know, are they sleeping? You know, are they getting hot flashes? If someone comes in and they're like, I feel amazing, but I have too much weight. I'd like to take hormone replacement therapy. Obviously it's not a good, it's not a good foray. You know, it's not a good introduction into what you're going to do next. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, I would say that it's not the first thing. I mean, we kind of jumped into that because that's sort of the biggest trigger for that middle of the weight or middle of the body weight gain and sort of the immediate help. But also metabolically, our bodies are changing. So as our ovaries reduce, you know, production of hormones, our thyroid may become affected. And it's amazing to me how many people go into their doctor and they say, I'm having weight gain, I'm not sleeping, you know, and they're sort of given some options. They're usually given a birth control pill prescription or they're given like an antidepressant of some sort. Um, and obviously there's so much more to caring for our bodies at this age that, you know, it's really important that you consider all the factors. And Cassie and I had the benefit of working together at a company um, that, um, we, we collected so much data on patients and we collected <laughs> Fitbit data. So how much they were sleeping, how much they were exercising. We collected my fitness pal data, what they were eating. They would send pictures of food. We would look at 180 analytes in the blood. We would look at their genetics to see genetically, am I predisposed towards weight gain around the middle? Because we can't forget genetics, right? Because if you have a mother and a grandmother and sisters, and they're all sort of like Rubenesque, so to speak. They're, you know, bigger breasts, bigger hips. No matter how you eat, you're never going to have, you know, sort of the, you know, female athlete, skinny, you know, body. That's just not the body type. And so I think there needs to be some realistic expectation about the genetics that we carry. Yeah. And also the habits that we form day to day. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one of the questions that um, someone asked is what's with this refrigerator shape I now have 20 years after menopause. Uh, she says she's more of a box shape than she's ever been, even though she's doing strength training. And she just says, I'm pro aging, but this is a real drag. <laughs> Any suggestions? <laughs> And I think this goes along with several questions I got coming back to this idea of fat gain and muscle loss and understanding that with less estrogen, you know, estrogen tends to be the, the fat gain in the, the butt, the hips, the thighs, that like curvy, you know, lady shape. And when estrogen lowers, then your fat, your fat distribution changes. The other thing that can happen that many people forget about in this time of life is cortisol. And, you know, if anyone knows me knows that I'm talking about our stress hormones all the time, especially in this time uh, of, you know, 
during or post pandemic or who knows where there's just a lot of uncertainty and, and more stress triggers. And the reason that comes into this conversation is because during the menopausal and postmenopausal years, research shows that those can be some of the most stressful in a woman's life. And, and on top of it, you know, lowered estrogen can raise cortisol as well. And so we're looking at increased belly fat, that visceral fat around organs that can lead to change, you know, increased risk of chronic disease. So that's why some of that boxier shape may occur. Uh, and yeah, I've got, you know, some ideas of things to think about. Um, but Wendy, you know, any thoughts here as to what she could do about this? Yeah, so um, cortisol is, you know, it's our stress hormone, like you mentioned, we need it, it's highest in the morning, it declines over the day. So if you have untreated hot flashes, let's say, and you are hot flashing all night long, your cortisol levels are going to rise. And then when cortisol rises, insulin rises, and that's when you tend to get more weight gain around the middle. So whether you use a botanical, whether you use diet and exercise, whether you reduce alcohol, you know, treating those hot flashes is super important to lowering that cortisol. The other thing is DHEA is sort of, cortisol is an adrenal hormone. Um, and DHEA is its sort of partner. And DHEA is highest when we are young, when we're 25 years old, and then it declines over time. So not only are we having this, so DHEA is in the same family as testosterone. So they're lean muscle mass hormones. So the faster and the more your cortisol goes up, the more it suppresses your DHEA production over time, which is such a bummer. And so, you know, the whole cortisol thing is how can I lower my cortisol levels? And meditation is a really important thing. You know, they found that morning meditation not only lowers your cortisol at that time, but for the rest of the day, it also has shown that improves sleep. So that's one thing, exercise. So in the, in the immediate exercise increases cortisol, but exercising on a regular basis will lower your cortisol on average over the course of time. The other thing is drinking at nighttime. So a lot of women, you know, they come home from work, it's stressful, you know, we'll have a glass of wine or two. It's so much like sugar, like especially, you know, some of the wines, white wine is worse, um, unfortunately. And so that is something that will raise your cortisol levels too, increasing insulin resistance. And so we really need to focus on lowering cortisol if we want to lower that body fat. And so when we're thinking about, you know, lifestyle habits, some of the things I just mentioned, you know, getting regular exercise every day, but even more importantly, some of these, it's funny, all these patients pop up in your head, right? When you talk about these things, yeah. I have patients who are marathon runners and they're just, they exercise so much and they still have this sort of, you know, barrel shaped body. And what's really interesting is that if you don't fuel appropriate before you exercise, your body's going to pump out even more cortisol. And mm -hmm. so it's really important especially as women to not go into exercise in a fasted state because that pumps up more cortisol and then your body's like not your metabolism's going to say, Oh my God, I'm in a stressful state. I'm going to slow down my metabolic rate. And so I feel like some of these chronic exercisers are like, I exercise more than anyone else I know. And I really am not losing weight and I don't understand. And they're also not eating anything either. And so oftentimes I will find, as you do too, that people are not eating enough. And so their metabolic rate is slowing down because they're not getting enough calories. Yeah. Um, and so I'm actually not a huge fan of huge cardio. I mean, I think cardio is really good for us mentally and physically, but I feel like at menopause, our bodies physically respond so much better to weightlifting and strength training than it does to cardio. And so a lot of us don't even feel great. I used to run a lot more than I do now. But what I found was I was doing all this exercise and my weight was going up and I was like, what the heck? Um, and so weight training, so whether it's, you know, body resistance training, whether it's planks, whether it's, you know, lifting weights, all those things work so much better for lean muscle mass than all the cardio in the world. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, it, there's a question I want to um, ask you, but uh, just to follow up on that, if you're going to get a personal trainer, um, make sure that they have experience working with postmenopausal women and that they can speak to injury prevention. Um, you know, as much as I love a good 20 year old male personal trainer, God bless them, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> make sure the person has the credentials and the insight to be able to help you without injuring you. So I always like to throw that in there because it's, it's so frustrating to get injured, you know, when starting something like that and you can get injured with, yes. with strength training. Yes. You know, I even, for example, if women develop, you know, as estrogen falls and they start having not only muscle la loss, there's usually bone loss too. And so eating protein is really important, but also doing the right kind of sort of stacking exercises for the spine. So lifting weights over the head, things like that. So sometimes if someone has osteoporosis, I'll actually refer them to a physical therapist and just say, go learn the proper exercises in the right form. And it's easy to get a PT recommendation from your primary. So yeah, that's, that's a really great point. Yeah, it looks like Paula's had a good experience with someone who is Carol Clinic certified. Sharon's asking it about DHEA supplementation, if that's a good choice. Yeah, so, you know, DHEA is over the counter. And so it's a sex hormone, just like estrogen or testosterone. And there's, there's an enzyme that women have men to called the 5-alpha reductase enzyme. And it basically think about super fit women who are super, you know, they have small boobs. They tend to be like outgoing people. Those women usually have a lot of dihydrotestosterone. If we're talking about men. We're talking about super hairy guys with bald heads. So if you have a high 5-alpha reductase enzyme and you take DHEA, your body will convert a significant amount of it to testosterone. And a lot of women report they can have hair loss, they can have acne, it makes them angry. So I feel like DHEA can be super helpful, but you also have to work with someone who knows like, oh, you don't just want to take 50 milligrams of DHEA because what if it converts to estrogen in your uterus and you get uterine lining thickness because you're not on progesterone. So there's all these little factors that come into play. But if I use DHEA in women, I usually have them on estrogen too. I, it's not usually a standalone hormone because the last thing you want to do is have low estrogen, have a normal testosterone, but the estrogen's low in comparison. And then you're adding another androgen like testosterone and then all of a sudden you're like more ragey than you felt before and acne and your hair is falling out and then you're just like what the heck um That's so you have to be careful so i'd say like five to 15 milligrams is usually pretty typical that i'll use but just make sure you check in with your doctor to make sure that you're not doing any harm by doing that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ada asks a follow-up question to what we've been talking about. I think I can take this one. If I'm intermittent fasting and exercise first thing in the morning, how am I supposed to eat before exercising? Uh, and, you know, I, I think, Ada, that's the, the, the trouble probably with intermittent fasting. Um, you know, if, if you wanted to intermittent fast, you could look at changing your hours so that you are able to eat before exercising and see if that helps you know it may be that the intermittent fasting is working for you and you know the situation is working for you as is and if that's the case you know you don't have to change something that isn't broken uh but as a registered dietitian who works with people who've been you know chronically dieting have almost ptsd like reactions to you know tracking and weighing and and these kinds of things i actually find intermittent fasting fasting does not tend to be a pattern of eating that I recommend, again, just because the population of people I work with struggle with food obsession. And it may seem that just cutting out uh, food would solve the problem, but it actually doesn't. Uh, it, it, um, it's more of a band-aid than actually, you know, healing the root of the issue, which is the damage done by all or nothing dieting. So yeah, if the intermittent fasting is working for you and you're, you know, having the results that you want from it, then, you know, then it, it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And yet, if you are noticing that you're having this stubborn belly fat, that your exercise and your weight loss 
don't seem to be touching, then maybe that's a sign that intermittent fasting actually isn't working and either adjusting the hours um, that you're fasting or, may, or trying a different dietary pattern uh, may be good for you. And there is research to suggest as well that intermittent fasting, depending on how you do it, can raise your cortisol levels. So it may not be the, the best pattern um, for, you know, people in this uh, phase of life. Um, that's my personal opinion. But, you know, Wendy, you know, disagree, agree, where are you at here? Yeah, I think uh, prolonged nightly fasting, yeah. um, you know, like 13 hours where you don't eat any food is more, is better for women. Um, a lot of my sort of new, you know, our, pra our practice evolves as we learn new information yes. and we see patients and what works and what, what doesn't work. My patients are probably super tired of hearing me talk about this book. Um, this woman, um, don't pay attention to the abs on the front. Um, this woman, <laughs> Stacy Sims, she's a PhD and she, um, she wrote this book called Roar and what I, she hates fasting for women. She thinks women should not fast. Um, what I like about her is that she's an exercise physiologist and a dietitian. And when she did her PhD training, she had, she had access to all this machinery to measure things like body fat versus muscle fat. And, um, and so I really respect and trust um, the things she writes about. And she, she now, you know, is aging like me um, into menopause. And I found her information to be clinically really accurate, but also clinically in my practice to be really effective. And so she is, she's anti-fasting and says it's terrible because of that cortisol piece. Um, so really it's about, you know, eating some protein before you exercise. And then, you know, within half an hour after exercise, you have to eat some more. And so when we talk about like diet, um, you know, obviously protein is the very most important thing for avoiding bone and muscle loss. And I can't say that enough. I feel like people go, they use Noom, they do Weight Watchers because they feel like they have accountability. And so if patients do well with that account accountability piece, sort of what I've been doing over the years is I've been, you know, learning about disordered eating and trying to make sure that I'm not saying you can't have any of those foods because I feel like there, there are lots of studies that say if you restrict foods, then patients end up binging. Um, and so I really focus on, instead of counting calories, I count, I have patients count grams of protein. And so after menopause, our protein intake, and you can do this calculation yourself, is 1.3 grams per kilogram. That's for a postmenopausal female. If you have kidney disease and you have different protein requirements, you know, you should talk to your doctor about that. But for most of us, 1.3 grams per kilogram is generally what you need per day. And it's a lot of people will be like 90 grams of protein. That is so much protein. And I was listening to this talk or podcast last night about, you know, someone who's like, okay, I could have this four ounce chicken breast and this has this many grams of protein, or I could use quinoa, which has protein, but it would take six cups of quinoa to equal the same amount in like four ounces of chicken. So obviously there's going to be a lot of that caloric density and a lot of carbohydrates. And so obviously you can't eat six cups of, car of carbohydrates all the time. Otherwise you're just going to keep expanding. So I really focus on recommending the Mediterranean diet, not because I hate the word diet, but the Mediterranean eating way because it's whole foods, it's real food. So I feel like when we get into trouble with knowing what to eat or how much to eat, the more packaged foods we eat with all these little sneaky chemicals and flavor, natural flavors and colors, those things really increase our cravings towards things. So the more you eat of whole foods and you just do that like 80% of the time and you really focus on that protein, you will see a healthier body mass index and you will see healthier weight. So I really focus on let's count grams of protein instead of counting calories. Yeah. And you know, any of my clients here know that I'm always talking about protein as well. You know, 
exactly for why you're talking about, you know, also we can look at sarcopenia, which is muscle wasting that can occur with aging. And it's estimated that between 10 and 20% of postmenopausal women are suffering from sarcopenia. And the recommendation there is uh, 20 to 35 grams of protein per meal, um, which, you know, if you do the math, it, it starts to kind of even out with these recommendations that Wendy's sharing. But then also from that, you know, feeling obsessed with food or, or struggling with binging or struggling with overeating, that by simply getting protein in regularly throughout the day, which is always my first recommendation when working with anyone, uh, people often will find that they, um, that their cravings decrease dramatically. And actually by eating regularly, getting that protein in, you also are causing some, your blood sugar to be more balanced. And what we don't realize is that blood sugar imbalance can trigger cortisol as well. So, you know, it, it goes back to these same systems we're talking about here, the, the reproductive hormones, the stress hormones, the appetite hormones, blood sugar, it's all connected. And it's so interesting how, you know, staying on that protein, getting it in as a focus, rather than maybe focusing on restricting or eating less, you know, focusing on an abundance of things you can have uh, is, is perhaps, perhaps a more um, mentally healthy way forward. Yeah, so that's sort of the two most important things so far are the protein intake and strength training. Um, how many times a week do you usually recommend strength training? Because I usually find that clinically you have to do it like three or four times per week to be able to, you know, really notice the change. And there's so many ways to do it. There's so many programs to do that. But usually like, you know, 30 minutes, three or four times a week is usually what I recommend. Yeah, yeah. You know, I stick with the all the major muscle groups two times a week, which can end up looking like something like, you know, three to four times of say 30 minutes, because maybe you're not able to get all of the muscle groups in one go. Yeah. Um, but that's more of a generalized recommendation. So perhaps I should look into, you know, something more specific for uh for postmenopausal women. I'm curious if the American College of Sports Medicine has anything for postmenopausal women, I will look it up. Um, yeah, and the other thing is, it has to be something that you like, you yeah. know? I mean, you could have the most beautiful fitness room in your house with a Peloton and weights, and it just sits there. Mm -hmm. And so I don't do well exercising at home. Um, I know that for myself. I know I work much harder when I go to a class. And so I just, for my strength training, I go to yoga because it's a lot of balance, which we also lose Yes, a lot of, you know, body weight resistance. And so, but you know, I'm like, well, maybe I, maybe if I get bored of that, I'll go and, you know, lift weights. You know, you can also go to something like orange theory, which is half running and half weights, you know, and there's people there to sort of coach you, but for me, I have to schedule it in, otherwise it doesn't happen. And so for me, I know that's my sticking point. And, you know, for somebody else, they might do really well working out at home. Yeah. Yeah. Finding something you love is really important. A couple questions back on protein. Julie wants to know when calculating protein intake, are you using current weight and then adjusting down as the scale moves? There's a lot of different ways you can do it, Julie. Um, it's, it's more probably more accurate to get like a range um, that you're shooting for every day where maybe the upper end is your current weight, you know, times the 1.3, your current weight in kilograms times 1.3 and maybe 10 to 20 grams, you know, below that would be a fine range because it's, you know, again, these recommendations as well are not about perfection. It's about, you know, optimizing to the best of our ability. Uh, and so, yeah, that a range is probably just fine. Leilani, can you recommend information for whole foods and or vegetarian sources of protein? Um, certainly can. I don't know if you have anything you want to say about that, Wendy. I'm happy to take the question as well. Yeah, so I, I was trying to go out of this window and put in the chat my favorite protein requirement um, link because it's this great handout that's two pages from the American Dietetics Association awesome. and it's got you know, both vegetarian and animal based proteins. And so it really helps you to really sort of get a, get a handle on that. Um, if I can figure out how not to leave. <laughs> if you leave, I will look for you. <laughs> 
<laughs> yes, because I will, I'll figure out how to get that in there. All right. Um, yeah. Go ahead and, and work, work on that. And I will also, just so everyone knows, be putting this recording up with a transcript so you can read through, you know, if there's something specific you wanted to catch. Uh, and we can definitely p uh, post any links there as well. Um, so the next thing we're going to talk about, and I know this has been requested as one of the things someone wanted to learn about too, is bone health. Uh, and, you know, really understanding, of course, there's an increased bone loss with estrogen. And uh, there we go. Wendy just posted this great handout with the protein content of food. So take a look at that, Leilani. There are definitely a lot of whole foods, vegetarian sources of protein. You know, soy foods are great. And, uh, you know, Ginger Holton, a mutual friend of ours and fabulous dietitian, just recently did an amazing uh, Instagram video. I want her to post it to YouTube so I can share it widely, uh, uh, really debunking the myths about soy and the fear around soy in relation to, you know, breast cancer and things like this. Um, Ginger is a cancer, you know, specific dietitian and just smart, smart as anything. So if she says soy is good, I say soy is good. Um, I say so, soy is good. There you go. Yeah. I, I knew Wendy would be on board with, <laughs> with ginger. Yeah, because it's, you know, there's ah. so much great research on soy isoflavones and it's better to eat the whole food than take a soy isoflavone, you know, supplement. Um, and actually, Actually, it's really good for hot flashes. So, awesome. um, and I think along with the soy, because soy gets so much like negative press for people who have thyroid conditions, they're like, oh, I, you know, I, I don't eat cruciferous vegetables because they're not good for thyroid. And I'm like, of course they're good for, for the thyroid. You have to literally eat bushel, bushels and bushels of cruciferous vegetables to offset your thyroid function. So um, yeah, soy good, cruciferous vegetables good. I actually recommend for people um, like Ida who are, you know, morning exercise people is, you know, using like the Orgain protein powder. Um, I, you know, I, I think it's really hard to get 90 grams of protein per day, um, especially if you're not eating animal, you know, protein. Yeah. And so using a protein powder is a great way, or even collagen powder, um, you know, to get, to get that, you know, 20 grams of protein. And that way you can put in kale, you can put in, you know, I, I don't love juicing, so I don't recommend adding juice to things. It's hugely high in glycemic index and doesn't have any fiber. Um, but putting things in a smoothie and adding that you know, little scoop of protein, you know, that is a, a great way to get that protein in there. Yeah. And I mean, summertime, I think for me, I'm all about smoothies in the summer. Do not ask me to drink one in the middle of December. I'll <laughs> yeah. get it out of your hand. But, um, yeah. and you know, the other thing is some of the sort of Icelandic skier yogurt has like 15 to 20 grams of protein per mm -hmm. cup. And you know, a lot of that's non-fat, you know, I'm not afraid of fat. Um, I think fat is a good thing. Obviously not the fried fats, you know, not tons of canola oil, you know, not any of those fats, but like fish fats, nut fats. A lot of people are afraid of nuts because if you've done Noom, nuts are like a red food or something. No um, kidding. <laughs> yeah. Where it's like, oh, you only get three nuts because you only get 500 calories per that meal. And so oh. I am definitely like, okay, nuts are in a whole different category, like macadamia nuts. I mean, those, you don't want to eat a ton of those because they really are high in, high in fat. I mean, they are pretty globally dense, but I think that nuts are a great thing, especially walnuts. Um, well, here's the, nuts. the thing about nuts too, is recent research looking into, you know, into nuts. Yes, they are high in calories, but actually our bodies are not able to digest and absorb all of the calories in nuts. So if you're, you know, tracking your food and saying you eat a quarter cup of nuts, you're actually not getting that much energy, you know, that the tracker will tell you from the nuts, you're getting probably significantly less because they're so fibrous and they really retain a lot of the energy um, in the part that you, you know, pass out of your system. So, I mean, you know, there's a whole another point in favor of nuts right. where it's not calories in calories out. Either. Exactly. Um, you know, Linda asked about GMO concerns related to soy and, you know, that's one of those things where there's not a lot of research around it yet. I think that the GMO soy research 
research is more around processed soy, like soy isolates and things like that. So if you're doing like some edamame and, you know, maybe it's not organic, like I personally don't worry about that, but um, I actually really don't worry about anything because I think stressing out about your food does more harm than good. But if I'm making you know, optimal choices, um, I might do say an organic, you know, soy food that's more processed, like a protein powder, um, versus you know some edamame or whole food. I don't think the GMO is quite uh, as much of a concern in that capacity. Yeah. And it, you know, it is better to eat organic when you can, because pesticides, you know, they're not helpful sure. for us, but you're better off eating a vegetable than not. If you can't get organic everything. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, yep. Someone got a couple great, uh, great recommendations. One for a Centrix, one for a Kate farms, plant-based protein shake. It's and the premier protein got a lot of things. I love those product recommendations. So let's turn our attention to bone health. You know, one of the best things that someone can do for their bone health, of course, is that strength bearing exercise that we've already talked about, uh, or weight bearing <laughs> exercise rather is what I meant <laughs> to say. And so when you're thinking about like, what is weight bearing exercise, obviously Google, you know, could tell you, but just thinking about our bones um, grow or expand or get stronger when we're putting pressure on them, when we're, you know, putting a load of force on, you know, the bone. And so when thinking about the actions that you're doing, you know, uh, throwing and catching a medicine ball, for example, is going to be weight bearing, right? It's going to cause you know, the, the bones in your arms to grow. Whereas like taking a walk, not so much. Now, what is interesting is Nordic walking, which is, you know, a Scandinavian style of walking where they have Nordic poles. They're not the same as hiking poles. And there is a specific like technique that you use, but the Nordic walking is one way to get some weight bearing exercise while you're walking. You could take up a, you could do up a hill, you know, do some Nordic walking up a hill and now your walking is weight bearing. So just kind of an example of how you can um, be thinking about weight bearing exercise. Yeah. When I, 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 I bet way back when I first started into practice, like 2002, I interviewed at the um, OHSU Bone Institute. And uh -huh. what was really interesting is that I remember this guy, Miles Hopper, said, Hey, so what's the best exercise for improving bone density? And I was like, um, You know, running? And he was like, Hopping. You know, I was going to say jumping. Hopping, like jumping, ding, ding, so jump know. roping, um, you know, and obviously you don't want to jump rope and trip and fracture your pelvis on pavement. Um, yeah. So you want to do it carefully, but that's where the whole rebounder thing came where, you know, women on trampolines or jumping. I mean, that being said, you have to make sure you empty your bladder and you, you know, have good bladder control, which is a whole nother topic, but you know, anything that's sort of like heel drops, anything that's sort of putting pressure on the on couple the questions uh Suzanne wants to know does intensive yoga account as weight bearing yes I you know because there's a lot of standing on one leg there's a lot of standing there's a lot of like putting like a lot of pressure on your wrists um and so yes I definitely count yoga as weight bearing and Liz asks what about climbing with a vertical increase it would seem yeah yeah. I mean, like you're not, machine? is that the idea? Yeah. I mean, are you actually climbing? Cause there's no, you know, it's like you're on a wall and you're using a lot of muscles, but you're not necessarily putting pressure on the feet. So I think anything that like, you know, pressure on the ground for feet is going to be even better, but a variety is important. But the, you know, the bone density, we lose most bone within five years of our last menstrual cycle. If you go to your primary care, they don't start doing bone density scans until we're 65, unless you see sort of a functional medicine person who's like, that's too long. So I usually recommend doing a baseline bone density scan right around menopause. What's really interesting is that a lot of heavy exercisers, like women who had disordered eating in college, who ran marathons, who, you know, those women have a significant increased risk for osteoporosis, even though you'd think all that running is so amazing for bones. 
not great if you're sort of over exercising and mm -hmm. under eating or binge eating or so it's important, but definitely advocate to get a bone density scan. So, uh, or um, here at University of Washington, there were the women's health update, the osteoporosis specialist, you know, someone said, what's the best thing you can do to prevent bone loss? And she's like, take estrogen. Um, so again, a lot of people, you know, it always comes back to estrogen. Those women who have had breast cancer or don't want to use estrogen, there are plenty of women that sail through, you know, their last decade or their last, you know, third of their lives without taking any estrogen. And you can definitely build bones. You just have to work a little bit harder. So the protein intake, vitamin D, like, you know, the standard vitamin D is like, you know, maybe they've raised it to a thousand units. Um, but really us in the Northwest and postmenopausal women, we usually need about a blood level somewhere between 50 and 70 um, to not only like bones just need a blood level of about 30, which is like next to nothing mm -hmm. um, to reduce colon cancer risk, breast cancer risk, fall risk. You really need to get your vitamin D level up to, to 50. And most women I found that 5,000, 4 to 5,000 units of vitamin D every day is what they need to maintain that sort of mid 60s level. Um, if you get too much vitamin D, then your calcium can become abnormal and you can actually increase bone loss. So mm -hmm. you, you want to you want to do a blood test unless you have osteoporosis insurance doesn't love to cover it. And so you can get that covered through sort of outside labs or just pay out of pocket. I had one vitamin D test that a patient really wanted and she was charged like $700 for a vitamin D test. Crazy. Um, I was going to say, I, I think I paid <laughs> $40 out of pocket. So I was going to say it's not that big of a deal. I mean, that can be, but $40 yeah. compared to 700 is not that big yeah. of a deal. Yeah. So, oh you know, but vitamin D, even though calcium, you know, calcium alone doesn't tend to improve bone density, still recommended to take 1200 milligrams a day. I always consider diet as well. So I figure, you know, we all get probably about 500 milligrams. Um, if you're wondering how much calcium you're getting or vitamin D or, you know, vitamin K in your diet, the Oregon State University Linus Pauling Institute has the most amazing website on all the nutrients and food sources. So you can kind of calculate how much you're getting. But usually I recommend about, you know, 350 milligrams of calcium twice a day. You can't absorb more than 500 in one setting. And then some people like a one to one ratio with the magnesium. Some people get loose stools with that. So a lot of formulas are sort of a two to cal two calcium to one magnesium ratio. Mm -hmm. And then the goal with vitamin K specifically vitamin K2 as MK7, which is one type of vitamin K um, that helps keep calcium in the bones and sort of out of the blood vessels. And so usually vitamin K is something that you should take along with the calcium and the vitamin D to maintain bone density, along with the weight training, along with the protein. Um, and you know, all these things uh, per most things, you're going to hit different areas of the body. It's not just about lean muscle mass. It's about strong bones and, and that goes along with the, you know, avoiding Alzheimer's and mental clarity too. Um, there's a woman on the East Coast named Lisa Moscone, M-O-S-C-O-N-I, and she's doing a lot of research on the fact that women are 10 times more prevalent than men to get Alzheimer's disease, which is one type wow. of dementia. And the work she's doing is really looking at, yeah, estrogen is so important to our cognitive function. And at 50, we go through menopause and then we spend another 35 years without any estrogen. And this really accelerates aging in the brain. Um, but there's a lot of research on Mediterranean diet, getting enough sleep, having a faith-based practice, making sure you have community and that you're not lonely and that you're getting sleep. And so Alzheimer's you know, unless you have an APOE4, you know, times two, like you're very genetically predisposed to that. It's mostly, even if you have like some increase genetically towards Alzheimer's, it's like most genetic things. It's mostly lifestyle and this much genetic. So, and it's not just the one thing. Mm -hmm. You have to kind of do all the things. And at menopause, you're like cranky and tired and you're not sleeping and our basal metabolic rate slows down about 
400 calories per day. So it's actually true. What you were doing and what you were eating before does not work the same. It's kind of like pregnancy, right? Where you're like, pregnancy, I get to eat all the good things. And you're actually learning that, no, it's like the time when you need to be the most diligent. It's kind of like that for menopause. And so the the leaner the body mass that you want, the more fastidious you have to be. And so that's where this balance comes in of saying, do I, you know, the women I see in practice who look amazing, you know, they have like super lean muscle mass. There's probably a little bit of type, a lot of type A in those women, and there's probably disordered eating. And so when we look out and we're like, why does that person look so amazing? It's probably because they are struggling to look that way. And they are over exercising and under eating and they're only eating salads and chicken for lunch. And it's probably boiled. It doesn't even have any oil on it. So it's, there has to be some self-acceptance to sort of where do I, you know, where do I feel best in my body? You know, it's like, if you feel good in clothes and then you see yourself in a bathing suit and you're like, Ugh, I just am not what I used to be. You know, my mom was here recently and we were getting in the hot tub and I was looking at my mom and she's 77 in a bathing suit. And I was just like, I'm probably going to look like my mom in a cup, you know, <laughs> a few years because she has a good height weight proportion, but the skin thins and you do lose muscle. There are definitely, you can slow that down, but there is no, there's no easy fix. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's such a great point. I, I know my clients hear, hear me talking about this all the time. And so I, I wanted to, you know, say it again for the people in the back, like, there's no way to necessarily reverse time and, you know, go back to where you were in the past and a certain amount of self compassion and self acceptance is hard. And that's something that I work on with my clients all the time, because it is really difficult because we're getting these messages from society that our bodies are not good enough. And we are not worthy of love and acceptance from other people when our bodies are not good enough. And so it takes some work. It takes oftentimes untangling of traumatic experiences, you know, to do some of that self-acceptance work. So I, you know, I don't want to say like, Oh, just don't care about it. Like, it's not that easy. I know that from personal experience. Um, and I, I am pre-menopausal. So, you know, uh, not even the things that we're talking about here on top of it. Um, so yeah, thank you for that note. Like, yes, we're talking about, you know, fat changes and, and, um, you know, body shape changes. And yes, there are things you can do and, you know, ways you can optimize what you're doing. And also, you know, finding a way to do it with self-compassion and grace may be the most mentally healthy way forward. And I would second and agree with Wendy that those women who look like they have everything together, and this is true of other registered dietitians, <laughs> honestly, who look like they have everything together and probably naturopaths too. I'm like, I really think that this person has an eating disorder because their advice is not, you know, uh, uh, healthy and stable. And so, um, yeah, it just like, what do we want for ourselves to be this feminine ideal or, you know, something else and you can want whatever you want. Yeah, I know it's, you know, even with my, with myself, right. Cause we want to, we want to have acceptance of our bodies. Yeah. I'm 48, you know, menopause is eminent. It is coming. <laughs> um, and my, you know, it's like, I recently, my daughter was going to the prom and we, you know, I have a bunch of gowns and, you know, my husband's in the maritime industry. So it feels like they're before COVID was always these events. And so I hadn't tried on a lot of these gowns in a long time. And I pulled them out and trying on those gowns with her. And she's two inches taller than me and like 20 pounds less than me, right? Which is normal. You know, it's like we're seeing our beautiful children and they're in these teeny little bodies and they're like eating Cheetos. And we're like, why? You know, so it's this <laughs> sort of it's a it's a it's grieving it's grieving our sort of, you know, 30 year old bodies. Yes. And I know most of my patients are like, Oh, I would never go back to that age. Like I'm so happy where I am right now. And so there's like a small snippet of the day when you might have a little like, Oh, I wish. So I was putting on those gowns and there were a number of them that I couldn't like zip up or I could zip them up, but they definitely didn't look like they did 10 years ago. And I, you know, it threw me into a funk. 
Like it threw me into a funk for a while because I was like, man, and I'm like, you know what? This is what I do all day long. Like I tell people bodies shift and they're adapting and we need to adapt ourselves to it. Like yesterday it was warm finally. And so I put on this tank top and a pair of shorts and I'm walking to the park and it was just like a little more fitted than I'm used to. And I just was like, Oh, you know, I just felt gross. Like I felt like when I walked by someone, like I had to like stand up straighter or something. And I was like, this is ridiculous. If I had a t-shirt on, I wouldn't think anything about, about it. And so I think it also, I think part of it is also adapting our clothing. So we're, we feel comfortable. It's not constricting. We're not worried how we feel to other people, but I think there's something to be said for saying, you know, those size eights might fit, but they don't fit very well. And I feel my giant muffin top coming over the top. Like maybe I should do size 10 and a high waisted and then you'll feel better. And so yeah. there's a lot to be said for adapting your wardrobe to your adapting body. But I don't like the having a closet full of size eights to 14s and sort of like going through this process of like gaining 25 pounds and then losing it. And like, that's not healthy either. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 It's a nuanced conversation and there, you know, it's, it's another place where all or nothing doesn't really have a place. Um, especially when we're talking about the way we feel about things and the health of our bodies. There's some really great questions we haven't gotten to uh, one from Linda. She wants to know if there's a form of calcium that's best absorbed that she should be keeping her eye out for. What's your recommendation for that? You know, there's a lot of expensive calciums out there. And, you know, when, when we worked together at the genetics company, I was on the clinical team and everything we said had to be like nailed down in 50 different ways in order for for us to like present that data. So I spent quite a bit of time looking at absorption rates of calciums. So let's start with what not to get, calcium carbonate. So if you go to Costco and you get a chewable calcium and you're like, this is a delicious little chocolate chewy, awesome, it's probably a thousand milligrams of calcium carbonate. Pretty poorly absorbed. So calcium citrate is almost as well absorbed as some of the hydroxyapatites or the, you know, MCHCs or, so I just like straight up calcium citrate. Great. That's a great recommendation. And then another question I want to make sure we get in in these last few minutes was several people asking about reduced sex drive. Imagine what do you do about it is probably more um, salient. Yeah. So, well, first of all, you have to question like why is it reduced um so a lot of times it's just because it's so uncomfortable that you have so much vaginal dryness that you know you're you're afraid of intercourse so you therefore you don't want to have it so improving vaginal dryness they make hyaluronic acid suppositories that you can get on amazon i mean which is questionable <laughs> um you have to use fix <laughs> fix um, even if you've had breast cancer or you're concerned about hormone replacement, you can actually use a vaginal estrogen suppository, which is so low dose, it doesn't increase your blood level. So it doesn't help hot flashes, but it'll fix that vaginal dryness like two weeks usually is what it takes. And then you use it a couple times a week after that. It is a prescription. Um, so fixing that, the other thing is evaluating your relationship. You know, so when people say my libido is terrible, I'll say, do you like your husband? And half the time they're like, mm. so obviously having a healthy relationship, not only with your person, but also with your body to say, is my sex drive low because I feel so uncomfortable in my skin and I don't want anyone to see me naked or, you know, or your body does weird things. Like sometimes women will pass gas while having orgasms and they're like, what the hell is this? Um, so there's like the mental piece of it um, and then there's the physical piece. But when it comes to sex drive, a lot of people are like, I need testosterone because my sex drive is low. I will say the women who tend to be very uh, curvy, they tend to do well with testosterone for sex drive and it's super low dose. Usually you have to get it compounded. There's a lot of controversy on that, but you're not going to get testosterone for women in a regular pharmacy. Um, and then the women who tend to be the wiry, muscly kind of women, they tend to do better with estrogen for sex drive. Hmm. Interesting. 
Yeah, you know, I think that's a really great point. The other thing that comes up for me when thinking about mentally what's going on is around food, I'm often talking to people about their connection to pleasure. And, you know, if pleasure and enjoying things um, feels okay and feels good, but we can, many of us have, you know, whether it be impacted by trauma or just the way we were raised or specific experiences, uh, some diff a difficult relationship with pleasure, which I find, you know, is usually something that isn't necessarily a post-menopause only issue. Like it doesn't just crop up out of nowhere. It may be more lifelong, but that can certainly play a part of this, you know, mental cognitive piece that you're talking about, Wendy. And, you know, that is work that I do in relationship to food, not necessarily your sex life. I would recommend uh, a therapist for that if you don't have the issue with food. Um, but yeah, that, that's some more things to think about is yes, you know, mechanically it can be the body, but mentally there's definitely more that can be going on as well. Yeah. And the other thing I recommend is, you know, it's like some women are very uncomfortable, you know, touching their bodies. Mm -hmm. um, and so part of being able to not only have a sex drive, but get to that climax, sorry about the phone. Um, I actually have a landline still, <laughs> um, is, you know, learning how to find your own orgasm and participating in, you know, in that. And so lock the door, whatever, like learn your body, and then you can ask for that, or you can participate in that. And I feel like one of the benefits of aging is the wisdom to be able to know what works and what doesn't work. So masturbation can be super helpful for sex drive because I feel like people sort of don't do it and don't do it don't do it and then they're like oh can I even find my orgasm or oh I'm so uncomfortable and I'm like just practice on your own you know it's like there's a lot to be said for that yeah that's great and uh you know one other thing anything else you want to share about brain fog or risks and self-advocacy regarding cognitive decline that was another theme that has come up yeah, um, you know, there's a guy named Dale Bredesen, and he is at UCSF, I believe, um, but he's a neurologist, and he wrote a book called The End of Alzheimer's, and what's interesting is that if you Google his name, you know, there's a lot of naysayers that are like, oh, you know, this is not going to be, you know, there's no science behind that, but how can you prove, like, eating well is going to help your brain function? So a lot yeah. of this is just common sense. But I would recommend maybe getting that book and sort of going through there and seeing like, what are the recommendations? What can I do to improve my cognitive function? Um, because there are so many factors that come into play with that, but it really comes down to living like a pretty healthy lifestyle. So you have to sleep, you have to exercise, you know, you can't drink too much. Um, alcohol, you know, let's touch on that for weight. You know, like we talked about that. Um, but usually the, the World Health Organization is like one drink per day, which is like five ounces of wine. I don't know who pours five ounces of wine. Um, maybe there's those $20 <laughs> glasses of wine that you get at hotels. They're probably five ounces. Um, <laughs> but most people don't drink that much. Um, so drinking alcohol can definitely decrease um, your cognition, you know, and stress. Also, there's so many over-the-counter medications that are now associated with, you know, dementia risk, like taking Benadryl or Tylenol PM every night. Um, so some allergy medications and, you know, sometimes the, the benefit outweighs the risk, but just make sure none of the over-the-counter things that you're taking are increasing your risk for dementia. Yep. Yep. Great. Well, I've so appreciated your time to everyone who's asked questions. Thank you so much for being here. I hope you got a lot out of this. Like I said, this is going to be recorded and posted and I'll make sure to just send it out to everyone who was here so you can access it again later with a transcript. So you can go, what was the name of that book? What was the name of that? This, that, or the other, right? Cause that makes things so much easier when you can control F the page and find what you're looking for. Yeah. Um, yeah. Ooh, so that's a good hint. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll put it at the top so you remember the hint too. <laughs> well, before we go, let me just say one thing. Um, so get your yearly blood work done, you know, get your thyroid function checked, you know, treat the, you know, make sure you're not metabolically in sort of like pre-diabetes. Um, checking your fasting insulin can give you some good information on where, where is that hanging out? Cause it does give you information on the cortisol. 
So doing blood work and actually pushing for more advanced blood work is important. Um, and then the other thing is just weighing yourself on a scale. I mean, I think it's important to know sort of where you stand, but you can, your weight can vary two to six pounds on any given day. And people will be like, ah, you started me on this and I gained four pounds. I'm like, just wait a day and recheck, you know? So I think that's important, but there is something called a DEXA scan, which is different than the bone density scan, which measure, measures percentage of fat in the body versus muscle. And so if you're like, doing all this work and I'm seeing things, but I'm not seeing the, you know, the number on the, on the scale change, you might consider talking to your doctor about getting one of those because sometimes that's a lot more motivating versus being like, okay, I'm building muscle. I'm feeling better in my clothes, but the scale still says that. So yeah, don't, don't listen to the scale. Such a good point. Yeah. Death to the scale, honestly. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> So much good research, I get it, but you know, it's it's causing a lot of people problems with their lives. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you all. So many people have enjoyed this and been giving their thanks in the in the chat. Um, and yeah, hopefully. Yeah, and I I'm gonna put my website in the chat. Thank you, um, Wendy. I'm so sorry. I meant to ask you how people can follow up with you. Yeah, so I'm licensed in Oregon and Washington. And so even if I have patients far away, we can do telemedicine. But sometimes it's just a good addition to have someone who can help you look into the things that your doctor won't. <laughs> so yeah.